Welcome to Critical Role Demystified. I'm Mike Christensen, and this is the series where we break down the lessons we can learn as GMs and as players from episodes of Critical Role. Today we're tackling episode 34, Race to the Ziggurat. If you'd like this video series to come out weekly, support me on Patreon. Every single person who joins, even if you just join at $1 a month, makes it more possible for me to hire an editor to help with the workload needed to cover a new episode of Critical Role every Thursday. That happens when we reach 1,000 patrons, and right now we're hovering around 500. So if you're watching this and you feel like you could give only $1 a month, it may not seem like a lot to you, but it actually makes a huge difference towards hitting that goal. Now, on with the episode. This episode features the return of... Ashley Johnson as Pike. And you know what? Actually, right, ne right next to Travis, you guys are size appropriate for the group, so it works out really? well. Really? <laughs> Hello, Pike. Wait, wait. <laughs> oh, hi, Grog. Oh, hi, Grog. <laughs> there we go. Oh, yeah. there we go. <laughs> and then, just a few minutes into the game, Laura arrives looking very stylish for the party's date with Destiny. She just came from the Video Game Awards where they announced her character in the Uncharted games. Also, just a reminder that in the game, Right now, they all magically look like a bunch of Percy's and Cassandra's. Can't imagine why the cartoon adaptation didn't include that detail. It's not ridiculously confusing or anything. Also, in the last episode, Trinket was magically given Percy's glasses and Cassandra's white streaks, but they forgot that detail, so in this episode, they just describe him like a huge, rotund Percy walking on his hands and feet. D&D is good. As the game opens, Matt asks if there's anything else they want to do while they have the chance, before they delve further into the dungeon. Anything they want to prepare, or cast, or drink. This is like that moment in the Spider-Man PS4 game when the game goes, Hey, this is your last chance to upgrade your gear before the final mission, so smoke them if you got them. That's not a direct quote from the game. And in this episode, that's pretty much exactly what Matt says. He'll often ask his players if there's something they want to do before he describes the next story beat, but he usually does so in a way that seems to say more like, just making sure nobody wants to do anything else before I move on. But here, because this really is a very important boss fight to them, and he knows they're getting really close, they're through all the combat encounters meant to slow them down, there's basically no chance they won't fight the Briarwoods within the next hour, at least the next hour from the characters' perspectives, he just flat out says it. You've all gathered yourself, taking the short rest to heal up. Um, whatever else you want to do to prepare at this time, you know discussions, items, preparation, trading, anything you want to do before you delve any further into this tunnel underneath the city of Whitestone, now's the time to do so. Grog has a bunch of healing potions that he can distribute, but he asks everyone what they'd be willing to trade for them. So Vax lets Grog flick him in the nuts in exchange for a potion. Matt actually has Vax take a point of damage. I've talked in the past about how we can and should explain hit points in our games and whether or not they're meant to be literal damage or just stamina, but honestly, I could see the argument for both of those explanations costing you a hit point when you get flicked in the nuts with a Goliath's finger. That would probably hurt like hell. But you probably already know the lesson I'm going to say, right? This is yet another way Matt and Liam are reinforcing the core fantasy behind Grog, to be the strongest mother effer in the room. After this, Grog doesn't need a trade from anybody else to get a potion. That seemed to satisfy him. Vax and Vex sneak forward together, a benefit of the magic item he gave her. Now her stealth is pretty good. But before they start to move forward, the holy symbol Vax stitched onto the back of his glove starts to glow, and Pike returns in her astral form. Now, Pike famously has terrible stealth rolls because she rolls a disadvantage thanks to her armor. But I was expecting the party to, you know, try to debate that if it came up, because she's not technically here. Since her armor is astrally projected, couldn't it make no noise at all? Why would she still have disadvantage on stealth? But Matt probably saw this issue coming because he's ready with a new narrative explanation for why Pike would still have disadvantage on stealth checks. Is she kind well, of glowing? So. Is she like... Pike is giving a low a candle light around her, so she's okay. gonna want to keep her towards the back, probably. <laughs> Pike always ruins stealth, even when she's... <laughs> See? No negotiation needed, no debate required. Pike has crappy stealth still, even in this form, and more importantly, the party accepts this. The twins move forward, marking several traps along the way to warn the party not to trip them. Then they enter a huge room with walls and floors made of hammered bronze. There are a number of gems in the walls and floor, and after quite a long time of everyone trying to figure out what the room is, they finally each put a hand on one of the stones. This causes two green residuum doors to slam down on either side, trapping the party inside this bronze room. But the gem Cassandra touched was on the other side of the far door, so she's not trapped in with them. And then the door they've been trying to open the whole time, this stone door beyond her, opens to reveal the Briarwoods. Vax can see a button on the other side of the Briarwoods, so he uses his cloak to cast Dimension Door and a beer behind them and slam his hand down on the button. 
This does not open the green glass doors. It releases acid into the room with the rest of Vox Machina. And Cassandra watches Percy with a combination of desperation and coldness. Your sister left us the day those arrows found my chest. I should not die from those wounds, but to watch you leave me there in the snow. I have a new family. I am a Briarwood. And I have a destiny with the Whispered One. She steps back as the two Briarwoods put their arms around your sister. And even still, there's like a shake to her voice, and you can see in her eyes there's, there's a quake. She speaks words of conviction, but you know deep inside, even there's conflict. I've talked before about how sometimes I don't want the party to roll for things because I don't think one of those results, maybe a success, maybe a failure, should be a reasonable outcome. In this case, Matt could have called for an insight check, but if Taliesin had rolled low, then he would have missed out on some very important information he needs to know. Cassandra is betraying him right now as we speak but she also might not be in full control of her actions, or at the very least, there's internal conflict. Throughout these past two episodes, whenever she's spoken to the party about her failed escape, the rebellion, her capture, what she knows about the Briarwoods and what she doesn't know, they've been rolling insight checks. And Matt has told them that she has seemed truthful. And yes, sure, you could explain this away by just saying that she's got an incredibly high deception skill, but I don't think that's the conclusion we are meant to take away from this. I think Matt was being forthright, because Cassandra was being forthright. But she's also been captured by the Briarwoods for three years, and who knows what sort of manipulations she's experienced in that time. So Matt didn't want Percy to roll an insight check because there was a chance he would fail. And he also probably especially did not want any of the other players to roll an insight check because this isn't information they should get if he fails. It's a great solution to that problem, just to avoid the roll entirely. The Briarwoods leave with Cassandra and Vax, leaving the rest of the party to deal with the acid room trap. The cast goes into problem-solving mode, and they eventually, eventually, smash all the gems and open the doors, and they're able to escape the trap room. Also, Vex takes a potion of flying during the scene when she's trying to get up and away from the acid. That's going to be important later on. As they escape, Percy's gun flashes, and a new name has been added to the barrel. Cassandra Girolo. Now, in my last installment in this series, I referenced that Matt was doing something cool with the villains in the Whitestone arc. I'd like to highlight this now because I think it's really awesome. This is something I found on Tumblr years ago, back when I was on Tumblr, and it left such an impact on me that I literally emailed myself the link and the description so I wouldn't lose it. This comes from Tumblr user Curie Bell. I'll summarize and then I'll add my thoughts. See, Curie Bell pointed out something very cool about the Briarwoods and their allies. Professor Anders is a bard. Scanlan is a bard. Ripley is a scientifically minded inventor fascinated with guns. We have one of those too. Curie Bell essentially proposed that every name on the list was a reflection of someone in Vox Machina, specifically the six members who were journeying to Whitestone back in episode 28. She focused on the names on the list, which is why somebody like Count Tyleri is not on this list in the Tumblr article. Pike also doesn't have a dark mirror in this theory because she wasn't really part of the campaign when the arc kicked off. Now, I'll leave a link to this full theory in the description, but I'm going to springboard off of this and make my own connections. Because I think we get some more accurate or interesting connections if we leave Percy's list behind and expand our scope to include all of the new nobles in Whitestone. And to be fair, not all of them have a mirror in Vox Machina. There are more than eight villains in Whitestone, so we have some extras who don't line up with our heroes. This explains why we have somebody like Count Tyleri, who is just a noble who was turned into a vampire. That character doesn't represent the opposite nega version of a Vox Machina party member, it's just the logical extension of the idea of a vampire ruling the city through intimidation and gaslighting. Someone like Tyleri would come to pass through that circumstance. Now let's start with one of the most obvious examples, at least from my perspective. I think Grog's counterpart is Duke Vedmire. He's the only other Goliath we've seen in the campaign so far who wasn't a member of Grog's herd, and the first Goliath we've actually seen in the livestream, so I think his connection to Grog is very obvious. Likewise, I think Vex's counterpart is the archer they saw in the forest when they first arrived, Countess Jasna Grabin. The party completely bypassed her, so we don't get to see her in action. She kind of never plays a role in the campaign, but she wields a bow and arrow, and she commands wolves, and so I think that links her to Vex and Trinket. Like we already said, 
Anders is Scanlan. It's not just that he's a bard, but he also makes his first appearance threatening a woman at knife point, something very much unlike our Scanlan, marking him as Scanlan's foil. Remember, as discussed in my Van Richten's video, a villain can be a mirror of the heroes either because they share an ideology or because they have opposite ideologies. This seems to be the latter. Scanlan would not threaten a woman that way. Ripley is the gunsmith, and Ripley also has a little bit of magic, just like Percy's magic that he gained during this arc. Also, as Curie Bell points out, the party first met Percy in prison, and similarly first encountered Ripley in the dungeon beneath Whitestone. Here's where it gets a little murky. We don't have a direct link for Keyleth. Curie Bell suggests Delilah Briarwood. She wields necrotic magic, an opposite to Keyleth's nature magic, and she's at least partially responsible for hanging people from the sun tree and desecrating it. But you could also argue that Delilah reflects Tiberius, since he was a powerful spellcaster who was still part of the party when they first encountered the Briarwoods. Perhaps, then, Silas is Keyleth, because he's literally dead, he's just as responsible for desiccating the tree as Delilah, and because he's a vampire, he can transform into animals. Although he really doesn't do that very much during the campaign, I don't think he does it at all, actually. Sir Stonefell doesn't really fit with anybody else, he's just a two-weapon fighter. Curie Bell suggests he represents Vex because he manages the money in town, but... I don't think Stonefell has a pairing. Well, to be more accurate, I think we're maybe meant to assume Stonefell represents Vax, since Vax also wields two blades at a time. But Vax has another foil. Because here's where this theory gets really juicy, and why I wanted to share it. This is fully Curie Bell's epiphany, and it has stuck in my mind for seven years. Because Cassandra is a rogue, just like Vax. But she also does something that Vax would never do. She betrays her sibling. This makes her his perfect opposite. This isn't just an awesome thing Matt did because it was fun. It serves two purposes. First, it turns the other Briarwood allies in town into mini-bosses that will actually be worthy of the time their individual fights take. Using the heroes as inspiration also gives each villain something unique about them that Matt can build off of to make a more unique encounter. And it opens the door for new ways that the other players might have an emotional response to these villains, which helps to further hook them into the story and keep this from becoming the Percy show for 12 sessions. I could see Matt being worried that Travis, for example, wouldn't have an awesome enemy he would be excited to fight for a good stretch of the campaign, but he knows that Grog is always keeping an eye out for powerful fighters to square off against, and he's always keeping an eye out for Goliaths, so he might make Vedmeyer a Goliath specifically to give Grog somebody to square off against. Of course, he had no way of knowing that he didn't need to worry about that. Grog would wind up being delighted by every horrible thing Vox Machina did to the nobles, and then, once they entered Whitestone Castle, Travis gave Cassandra the side-eye for two full episodes, not trusting her at all. He was fully invested in the story. But I also want to point out that this is something we can do in our own games. See, Matt invented some of these characters, but others, the Briarwoods, Anders, Ripley, Cassandra, and Stonefell, were given to him through Percy's backstory. Taliesin came up with those characters, and even though he didn't really give them any class levels, he gave Matt their names and just a little bit about their dynamic with each other, and maybe with Percy. But Matt took those and decided to turn them into reflections of our heroes, and fill out the cast with more characters to keep the players entertained and occupied as they moved through the city. We can do the same thing in our games. We can even do this with pre-written adventures. Nothing is sacred except for one thing. The fun of our players. But also, sometimes we do these things because they entertain us. And that's fine too. They sneak ahead and they see the ziggurat ahead of them. They're directly beneath the sun tree, and Keela suggests that perhaps she and Pike especially Pike, can use the tree in some way to help take down the Briarwoods. The group asks if Palor, the god who reportedly planted the tree, is close with Serenray, Pike's deity. Matt says that Palor and Serenray have similar domains and both have similar concerns, so they'd probably get along all right. This is such a funny situation, because the cast was playing in Pathfinder for two years, so Serenray has basically been inherited into their game world because of that. But now that they've switched to D&D, they're playing with the Pantheon from 4th edition D&D, which already has a god of light. It's Palor. And so his answer is, yeah, they're both here. No big. It's not a perfect solution from a world building perspective because honestly, they're kind of redundant with each other. If this world had been designed from the ground up, they wouldn't need both of these gods. But that doesn't matter. What's far more useful is to empower your players to choose the gods they want to follow. I love to develop pantheons for my worlds. I did a couple of live streams showing off that process on my Patreon. Those links are in the doobly-doo below. But I'm also flexible enough that if a player came to my table and said, I want my character to worship Thor, I'd be fine with that. Because giving players the power to make that decision on their own is far more important than the cohesiveness of my game world. They whisper to Vax through their earrings to try to get through to him, and he still cares about his friends so he doesn't give away that they're still alive. 
When Delilah asks who he's talking to, he answers, Saren Ray. But you know, she would rather that he didn't do that, so she asks him to stop. Liam asks uh, Matt if Vax fully believes the Briarwoods are his closest friends, or if he's just a puppet, and he has his own free will beyond that, like Kilgrave and Jessica Jones. Uh, that show was currently premiering, or right about to premiere, so the timing of that was really useful. Pop culture can be a really great way to help get our players' heads around some of the concepts in D&D. Unfortunately, Matt's answer isn't great, and it's not his fault. It's a problem with the vampire charm effect. Because the answer is kind of both. M more that he just likes the Briarwoods now? But that's very limiting, because this means Vax won't make a move against the Briarwoods, but also won't try to hurt his friends, which isn't a fun situation to play. And you already know what I'm going to say, the mind control video is coming for exactly this reason. Percy ascends the ziggurat to confront the Briarwoods, and the others flank around like velociraptors and attack from the sides. And it's initiative, so here are some highlights. Pike is able to cast Greater Restoration to cure Vax's mind control. Keyleth casts Sunbeam, which does damage to Silas, and thankfully it's a concentration spell, so she can keep doing it every round as long as she stays within range of him. Vax pretends he's still mind controlled so he can get close enough to Delilah to strike. Okay, that had whatever that poison is that I sold my soul to a hag for. Yes, it did. So go ahead and roll damage on that. Okay, so the regular damage is... Don't say you sold your soul to a hag. Let's deal with one problem at a time. Delilah casts Power Word Stun on Vax. You know, I'm starting to think she's kind of a powerful spellcaster. That might wind up being a problem. Silas is all up in Percy's grill, hacking the hell out of him. And Cassandra... Well, Matt rolls a die on her turn, and she drops her blade and spends her turn doing nothing. The cast realizes what this means. She's trying to fight Lord Briarwood's domination, and Silas is taking a lot of damage from Sunbeam, so Delilah says something very interesting. She says that they are not ready, but the timetable's been pushed. We have no choice. Once again, give it up for that Matt Mercer mid-combat exposition, making it seem natural while still giving the players a lot of information. Then she tries to teleport somewhere with Silas, but Scanlan counterspells it. Silas tries to dominate Grog, and Grog fails the role. Except then Travis remembers that Grog can't be charmed while he's raging. Things are actually going pretty well. They bring Silas to zero hit points, but he transforms into mist, because that's what vampires do when you kill them. But then Keyleth channels her sunbeam into Silas, and she gets the how do you want to do this. And when Matt asks her for a description, we get a perfect example of how Matt and his players describe damage. See, Matt always says that when he asks how do you want to do this, he's asking the player to describe the kill. And that's true. For the rest of any combat encounter, players will say they want to attack, maybe they'll give it some flavor, and then when they hit or miss, Matt will describe how the attempt plays out. We'll talk about that some other time, I think, because it is still really useful to see how he dramatizes their actions to keep combat from feeling slow. But this is a terrific example of how he handles how do you want to do this finishing move moments when a character gets a kill. Because, basically, the rhythm he has with his players goes like this. First, the player rolls, does damage, and Matt says the thing. I guess, uh, in this particular instance, I want to ask you, how do you want to do this? Yeah! Yeah! Uh -huh. Sorry, cursed gun! There, there, there's, uh, there's still a, a you know, semi-visible uh, form of like his body, but in a mist form, is trying to slowly escape off of the top of this structure. Okay, Pike is standing right next to him? <laughs> Correct. Matt doesn't always follow the how do you want to do this with a reminder of what the situation looks like, but he does do it sometimes, and that's really valuable. It reminds the players what the scenario looks like and gives them the tools to properly come up with an appropriate kill. So then the player describes how they want to finish off their foe. And here's the thing. I've played in games where players get the ability to describe kills. I run those games. And at most of those tables, the players have carte blanche to describe the finishing blow however they want. They'll describe the limbs they cut off of the enemy, uh, the flips they do, the imaginary camera moves, any slow motion that accompanies that, all of it. But Matt's players don't do that. They found their rhythm, and it goes like this. The player will describe the kill, but they'll only describe their character's actions. They don't describe what it looks like when the villain takes damage. They won't describe anything beyond what they are doing. Now in this case, I'll play the clip, and admittedly, Marisha's description in this scene is more vague than what the players normally describe, but I still think that means this is a great example, because we're gonna see how Matt uses the information his players give him, and then he expands upon it. Um, so I'm gonna use Pike, and kind of use the light that she, I uh, have off of Pike, and kind of combine it to do like a joint sunbeam, uh, holy, holy, <laughs> in bomb. Okay. 
Right. Yeah. <laughs> he's he's gonna he's gonna eat a bag Do of it. holy dicks. Is what you're saying, right? Yes. I want to eat a bag of holy dicks. Okay. Now explain uh, that, please. Okay. <laughs> Make it sound great. Because that's the second step of the process. The players say how they want to do this, and then Matt describes what they do. He usually repeats what they wanted to do using new words, but still basically repeating everything they said. And then he elaborates how that plays out. In this case, he also makes it look completely badass. So, um, looking over at, at uh, Pike, already ready with her mace up in the air and the mist recoiling from her, you kind of glance at each other, have that connective point, and as Pike brings up her shield, you bring back your sunbeam and throw it towards the shield, arcing it in his direction as she ricochets uh, the reflection of the actual sunlight back at him at the same time. That was That's way cooler cool. than what you said. Yeah, way as, cooler. I knew he was keeping it through. As it, as it sprays across, um, the beams themselves seem to form nearly phallic rays. Cross the stream! <laughs> <laughs> Cross the stream! Tearing through the mist, and with an echoing scream, you hear Silas's voice ring out, <laughs> as the mist is immediately dissipated and disintegrated his form. Fuck you, Silas! <laughs> the players seem to have learned that until Matt says something, it's not real, it's not canon. There are plenty of times, even out of combat, where Matt reiterates what the players do, re-narrating it from a more omniscient perspective. The way finishing blows are described is just one aspect of that approach. But I think the implication he's making, whether he realizes it or not, is that the players don't have the full authority to determine everything about the kill. They still only describe their characters and their spells. And by the way, that's something his players are clearly fully on board with. This is how they've been describing their kills for eight years at least. And I just think that's fascinating. I don't know if they ever gave more detail than that back in their home games and then they pulled back when they realized his descriptions would encompass that aspect. They might have even never considered that this is what they're doing. But it's the rhythm they've used for almost a decade. And then we get Delilah's reaction to Silas's death. And yet again, this moment says a lot about the character of Lady Briarwood, because Matt Mercer knows that exposition and characterization don't stop when you roll for initiative. How's it feel, Lady Briarwood? Uh, she, looking over her shoulder, at, still looking at him as she's called to him to, you know, go join in the altar room, the ritual room, looks over and sees that he's missed form. And in slow motion from her perspective, she just sees Keyleth step forward, wind blowing around her, releasing this beam and watching him be disintegrated. Immediately her eyes open wide and she screams out, No! Silas! And you can see like her whole body shaking now at this point. The, uh, the, the horror of seeing her partner, the love of her life, disintegrated before her. Uh, tears immediately burst down her face and her hands are shaking in there. She just screams out, You can't! I broke the world for us! No. That's the end of your turn? Oh, no. That single line, that moment, inspired Laura to utter an oh no out loud. It made the cast, at least some of them, sympathetic to her. To Lady Delilah, please don't forget I murdered a child and hung him from a tree, Briarwood. And that is the power of strong characterization and of giving your villains clear goals. Delilah casts Dimension Door and vanishes. Grog threatens to huck Cassandra off the edge of the pyramid, but Percy stops him, so they tie her up instead. They head to the ledge of the ziggurat. Most of them are climbing over it by rope, but Vex is flying so she can get a bead on Lady Briarwood before any of the rest of them. She also takes a healing potion on her way up. That'll be important in a minute. Delilah is on an altar in a large chamber with the shape of a hand carved into the ground below her. And the walls are lined with writhing dead bodies, all of whom are missing their left hand and or their left eye. Also, Percy's pepper box misfires and his attempt to repair it goes super badly, so his pistol's fully broken. I mention that because it'll be important in the next episode. Delilah bleeds her own blood onto a black orb, which rises into the air. And then because Vex was the first in the room, Lady Briarwood casts Finger of Death on Vex, yet again, and hits Vex for 75 points of necrotic damage. Vex, thanks to that healing potion, was at 76. So she still has one hit point. Sheer dumb luck. The orb spins and becomes a, a small, spinning, dark orb about the size of a dime. Delilah is distraught. She was expecting more to happen, but thanks to the hero's interference, she had no choice but to perform the ritual early. So effectively, she failed. Except, that's not to say that nothing happened. All the dead bodies stop moving. Vex's flight ends and she plummets out of the sky and gets knocked unconscious. Pike's healing spell on her 
has no effect. Vax's healing potion does nothing. Magic has stopped working in this room, and Vex is bleeding out, so they have to medevac her out ASAP. Percy gets the how do you want to do this on Lady Briarwood. The black smoke is egging him on to finish her off, and he shoots off her arm, but in an attempt to keep her alive. They try to heal Vex once again, once they're out of the ritual chamber, but it has no effect. They're still too close to the pyramid. They're on the pyramid, and I guess that's still too close for the effect. But as they rush out of the room, Vex comes back to consciousness. The cast forgot that three death saves doesn't mean that you have a hit point, it just means that you aren't dying. It's a very honest mistake to make in a very tense situation. Meanwhile, Keyleth checks out the spinning black orb and hits it with a shard of residuum to see what will happen. Hopefully it will disrupt the orb. She rolls a nat 20 on her strength saving throw, so as the green glass splinters and gets sucked into the orb, she only takes 18 points of damage and is not pulled into the orb. Seems like this thing is pretty bad news. It almost broke every bone in her hand and also maybe almost killed her. Grog drags Lady Briarwood out of the room and Keyleth stays behind to become an earth elemental to tear the ziggurat down. Except she can't transform. Even that magic is limited. So they all retreat from the ziggurat chamber. And that's the end of the episode. Thank you so much for watching. We'll be back with another episode of Critical Role Demystified in two weeks to discuss episode 35, Denouement. There's a lot of really awesome stuff in the way this arc ends, and I'm so excited to talk about them in the next installment. In the meantime, I make other awesome videos every Monday and Thursday, so be sure to subscribe. If you'd like every video I post on Thursdays to be my Critical Role video, sign up for my Patreon to help make that happen. Again, $1 a month, that would, that's all it would take. I'd also love for you to join my Discord server, the community there is really wonderful. Follow me on Twitch to catch my live streams, subscribe to my newsletter to get occasional updates. I'm once again going to urge you to check out my recent Temple of Doom video, it took so much time and energy, and I'm super proud of it, so go watch it if you haven't already. Until next time, play fair, and have fun.